Hey everyone, and welcome to this class on mug toppers. Now, I'm filming this class while I'm recovering from bronchitis. You might notice my voice isn't quite normal, but the fact is I've been sick for 10 days. I can't take it anymore. I needed to get in the studio and do a little something. So I thought I'd film this really simple, sweet class on making mud, mug toppers. See, I can't even pronounce words right. It's so bad. I actually lost my voice for almost six days. It's just come back in the last few days, but you can hear it going in and out. So, I mean, some people might think that's kind of cool having that like really like whiskey soda, scotch and soda voice or something, like a scratchy hoarseness to your voice, but that's not my normal sounding voice, so um, I apologize. But I'm okay, I just have still a bit of the cold. And it's gonna go away and I'll be fine, but I wanted to do something for you and also to help me feel better, I needed to get out here to the studio, right? Because this is my happy place. This is the place I go to when, well I go to it every day because I love it, but I go to it when I need inspiration, I need to do something to make me feel good, to make me feel happy. I mean this, this I'm very blessed I have to say that my job is in the studio and I get to do this every day, but if this wasn't my job I'd be in here as much as possible like I already am. All right, so what is a mug topper or a mug lid? Ah, I gave you the name, it's a mug lid, that's it. And it's a really simple thing to do and I really like to make sets of these. Now when I first started making them, I didn't do them as sets with mugs because people would buy a mug and they didn't want this. And then later somebody would come and say, oh, I want that for a mug I already have. So I'm gonna walk you through how to make one of these, but I'm also gonna walk you through how to make them fit certain sizes and so we'll talk about that. It's super easy. I bet I can teach you to make these and then you'll be able to go make a hundred of them in a day if you want to. Not saying you have to, but if you want to. So mug toppers are really great because here I have some on some wheel thrown mugs right here, that one there, and these are some hand built mugs and you can either make your mug topper design match the design on your mug. So this happens to be my Southwest rolling pin design. There's all my pins right there. And when I made the mug, I also made the mug topper. And so it just fits in there perfectly because they were made together. And the same thing with this sweater mug. I made one for there. And then here's a little guy all by himself. You know, he has no, he has no mate. So he will go with any mug, right? Someone will, will fall in love with it and take it home. But when you make them to match, you know they're gonna fit exactly. If you're wheel throwing your pieces, you're gonna have to take into consideration what size the rim is of your mug and make sure that your mug topper will fit this. Now, you could wheel throw a lid or hand build a lid to match it perfectly, but these are super fast, super easy. What I really love about these is if you do craft fairs, art shows, anything like that, and you need a small item that you can put out at the front of your booth, you know, something really little that will catch people's eye and it doesn't have to be a big ticket item, these are great for that. They're really useful and they're simple to make for you. So it is a great mug topper, a great lid. Why would you want to put a lid on your mug? Well, one, you don't want what you're drinking to get cold, do you? I don't. When I make a hot cup of tea or if I'm having a cup of coffee or something, I don't want it to go cold on me. So pour my tea in, go about my business, doing whatever I'm doing, put my little lid on it, can walk away and I know that my little cup of tea will still be warm. The other reason you might want to have a mug topper, uh, well, you know, sometimes there's little critters or flies or in my case, cats. I have cats in my house. My cats get on the counter. You know, you can try to keep your cats off your counters, but I don't know how you do it because I, in all my years of owning cats, well, that's wrong, I have been owned by cats, because you don't actually own cats, they own you. You know, if you have a cat, you know how that goes. So all the cats who've owned me have gotten on my counters and gotten into my stuff, they just do. So you put your lid on it, because I have come back into the room when I have had a cup of tea or a cup of cocoa sitting there and I have found the cat with its paw in the cup. No, they're not drinking it because they don't actually want to drink your tea or cocoa or coffee. They just want to mess it up and make a mess with it, splash it around everywhere, and then leave so you can clean it up and make yourself a new cup of tea. So mug toppers are really good for keeping your little loving pets out of your beverages. 
Um, and also, like I was saying, you know, flies, if it's summertime or if you have, I don't know, who knows, maybe you take your cup of coffee on the morning out to your deck and you set it down and you don't want a little bumblebee flying in or a moth or something. I don't know. Just, just some suggestions. All right, so that's enough rambling about why you want a mug topper and what you can put mug toppers on. And I actually have a few more ideas on what you can put them on and I'll, I'll put that in as we go along. And let's go ahead and make them. And the making is crazy fast. And I will put all the information as far as tools and materials posted here so you'll see that. Um, I, won't, I won't walk you through all the tools and materials because we don't want to waste our time doing that. We just want to make our mug toppers. And we want to make them right now. All right, so to make these mug toppers, and I'm gonna show you a close-up of one. It's kind of like a coaster, except it has a little bump on the back. So this is one that's completed and fired, and here's one that is green wear. So they do shrink, you'll notice. Look, we'll put, put them on top of each other. But of course, it depends on what size you make them. So I usually make them with these cookie cutters right here. And I have to tell you, if you don't have a set of these cookie cutters in your studio, you should. Even if you're a wheel thrower, they come in so, so handy. I use them all the time for hand building. And what I do when I get my set is I measure them and I write on it with a Sharpie marker what they are. So this is a four and a half. I don't know if you can read that. Four glare. There's a glare. Four and a half inch, a four inch, a three and a half inch, written right there, a three inch, and a two and a half inch. That's what came in this set. And you'll notice they're double-sided. They have a side that is just a smooth circle, and then they have this cute little ruffly decorative edge, which I like to use for my mug toppers because it's just something a little different than the circle. And you might want to go ahead and pick up one that's a five inch as well. Now, unfortunately, this one only has the round circle, so we don't get the fancy, pretty, cute edge, but sometimes you need a bigger, um, lid, right? A bigger mug topper. So you might want to pick up a five inch anyways. So now this is how I figure out what size we're going to make. I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the slab away for a sec because this is the most important before we can actually use that slab and make anything. We need to know what we're making. All right. So say you made the, the mug that I have, the hand build a mug class, right? And this is just a pretty simple mug. I, I usually call it my cabin mug style, but it's a very simple like a diner mug style, right? And when you're making this, in the class I have a template and the bottom of this mug is four inches. Now because I use a four inch circle to make the bottom, that's what this is here. Now it's shrunk a bit, right? But I know that the top, since I really haven't flared it out much, I know that the top is about four inches as well. So that means I need to make the mug topper overhang bigger than four inches and the little piece that goes inside has to be smaller. So for this mug right here, I use a four and a half and I use a three and a half. So I use those two sizes to make my mug topper for this mug right here. So write that down. If you wanna make this mug, which you do want to make this mug. I know you do. And it's super easy. Then if you want a topper that will fit it perfectly, use the four and a half and the three and a half. Now, if you're worried that your mug might warp a little bit, which it could, you know, if you don't dry it evenly, um, you know, that can happen. What I would do is instead of using a three and a half on the inside, I would use a three. And that just gives you a little more wiggle room. So if you have any warping at all on your mug, it'll still fit. So don't worry about that. And if you're wondering what the purple stuff is, that's wax. And if you watched my no crack video, it tells you exactly why we put this on here. It helps it dry slowly. I don't have to worry about my handles cracking. So that's what you're seeing there. Now normally, um, if I'm making a wheel thrown mug, it's a little different. So the hand build mugs, this is the same every time. So this mug right here, will be the same dimensions every time because I use a template to make it and I use a cookie cutter for the bottom. So I could make a batch of these right here and they could be completely done glazed and everything and then I could make the mug toppers later. They don't have to be made at the same time. That's the great thing about a hand built mug. All right, so now we're gonna move on. Now think about it. If you size up and you make a bigger mug or if you flare out your rim a little bit, you might have to make a few adjustments. So keep that in mind. So we're gonna set this one to the side and let's pull over a wheel thrown mug. 
Actually, I know it looks wheel thrown, I grabbed it. This is actually a hand-built mug too. <laughs> Whoops, this one's wheel thrown. Nah, you know, sometimes my hand building is, is, is pretty a-okay. So this is a wheel thrown mug. And when you're making your mug, if you know you want to make a top for it, or if you realize over time and you notice that all your mugs, the rims seem to be a similar diameter, that's a very good thing, especially if you want to make something like a mug topper. So let me grab my ruler and let's say this is wet clay. If you're throwing a piece and this is wet and you want to measure it when it's wet, you want to measure two dimensions. You need the outside flare for your overhang so we measure that and I'm getting three and a half. So if this was wet, I would definitely want to make sure I use a four, maybe a four and a half. And then the inside dimension on this is about two and three quarters. So I would use two and a half. Now this is shrunk, so our dimensions are wrong. If you wanted to make one to fit this exactly right now, you would have to use a shrink rule or know how much your clay shrinks. So you could make one. It's possible. You could make a lid right now that fits this or you could just do what I do, haha, <laughs> it fits. Um, this is a four and a half with a three. So for my wheel thrown mugs, if I just do a four and a half inch cookie cutter on the outside with the three inch, I think that's my three inch, three inch on the inside, it almost always fits. That's this one, it fits this one right here. Now you might have a little sliding, see how it slides a little bit? That's not really a problem. This isn't supposed to be a super tight lid that fits super snug because it's just keeping your tea hot and your kitty cat's paws out of it, that's all. Now these don't match. If I wanted to make a matching set, you know, this is Amico Smoky Merlot with Iron Luster on top. It's so nice. And this is Amico Aqua Celadon. So no, they don't match, but the idea is to show you how it works. And these don't match either. These are Georgie's tie-dye glazes on the mug from my spin art mug class where I show you how to create this cool design. And then this is Amico's Cherry Blossom Celadon. All right, so let's, let's actually make one. You're like, yeah, 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 get on with it. I'm working on it. All right, so I basically told you how to do it though. It's really simple. And if you're hand building mugs, it's even easier. And you know what, if you're wheel throwing, it's really not any more difficult. Just measure when you make it and make your mug topper at the same time. So I've rolled out a slab of clay and I wanna take a minute to talk about thickness of clay. I get so many questions, comments about how thick is my slab? This one right here happens to be 3 8 of an inch thick. I will roll out my slabs between 3 16 and three eighths, so three sixteenths, a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch. If I'm making really big, huge things, a half an inch thick, it all depends on what you're doing with it. Thinner slabs for smaller things, thicker slabs for bigger things. But the fact is, if you find a thickness you like to work with, then work with it. And if you roll out a slab that is a quarter of an inch and you're watching this and you're like, oh no, it's not gonna work because hers is three eighths, it, it'll work. It'll be fine. Don't worry, don't let that hold you back. The thickness of the slab is not crucial in the making of these pieces. If you're hand building, what's really important is the consistent evenness, right? That's what matters more than anything is making sure your slab is even. That's more important than anything else. So you can work thick, you can work thin, it's entirely up to you. So this clay is Laguna B Mix with no grog. It's their Cone 5 clay, which is a really nice porcelain stonework clay. And I'm just smoothing it out with this yellow mud tool rib. And again, I'll, I'll put all this information out there for you. And if you're making toppers to go with a specific mug, like I'm gonna make it to match this mug here, well, I wanna make the patterns match. If you don't know what you're doing with it, you don't know what mug it's gonna go on. Maybe you don't put a pattern at all. You just leave it plain and you just glaze it. That's fine too. You don't have to add a pattern. I know you are like falling out of your chair. Cannot believe that I said you do not have to add texture, but you don't. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this. This is my Moroccan tile roller right here. Do, 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 do. And it does have a little bit of dry clay on it. You can see on there. And I'm gonna roll that in. And I'm gonna share a little tip with you all. 
Now, here's something I am always telling everybody and I always want to remind you, when you're rolling texture, let's think about our body mechanics. If you're rolling texture straight out and you're putting all your pressure in a forward motion, you're actually not pressing down into the clay, you're pressing outward. So for me and most people out there, if you're, if you, I'm only 5'2", so I'm not a tall person. So for me to get a really good um, impression, I have to, I'm doing it right now, I just stood up on a step stool. So now when I press, I'm actually pressing down, down into the clay, not out away. And this will give you a really good impression. So I'm gonna press it in, just like that. Do you see how nice and even that texture is? Yes, you do, because I'm showing it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I do it. I stand up on a step stool. I keep a little folding one here in my studio because I need it for just about everything. When I want to reach stuff, it's just how it is. All right, so we added texture. Now I'm going to release because it was stuck to my birch plywood right there. So we release that. So I'm going to make the one that fits this mug. So I need to make it four and a half inches. I'm taking my four and a half inch cookie cutter. Now, if you have a hard time with your clay sticking to your cookie cutters, you could dust your clay with a little bit of cornstarch. Just use a brush or something and brush it on. Uh, I don't really do that. I just go all in. So we're gonna press down. I'm using the cute scalloped side. And I'll pop it off. Sometimes the little slab stays. That's okay, just lift it up. So we're gonna take this patterned side and we're gonna flip the pattern over because we're gonna be attaching the bottom to it. So we did that. And then for my bottom, let's just check this. So I, I can see if the four and a half, there's the four and a half on the outside with the three and a half is gonna be the right size. And it is, it's perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and use a three and a half for this mug, because this is gonna be a set. So we'll grab our three and a half. Now as far as using the scallops or the round, it's your choice. I usually go with the round for the inside. I don't know why, I just do. So what you can do is you can roll out, if you have a slab roller like I do, you can roll out a great big slab of clay. And you can then make about a hundred of these easily in a day. I don't know if you need a hundred, but if you're doing craft fairs, they are really handy. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of drop this down like that. You know, clay has a memory and it, it gets warped and it kind of torques a bit and it tries to go back to whatever shape it was in. So by dropping that, I've given it a new memory. I've flattened it out a bit. So for these, because there's texture on both sides, the way I'm gonna sign it is I'm just gonna use my stamp and I'm just gonna go on in with the stamp and find a place that I think my stamp will work with the design doesn't it's not really crucial it's just right here go right there so if you look you'll see my stamp right in there now I have one over here that I actually signed my name on it so it depends there's no texture here though I don't know why I did that texture on one side texture not at all on the back I don't know what I was thinking but if you want texture on the back you can stamp it Okay, so this one I added texture on the back and then signed and glazed over. So we could talk about lack of consistency here. <laughs> what is she doing? That one I signed. I think I went through a phase where I was signing everything. Uh, mug toppers now I just stamp. I don't worry about signing them. But maybe you wanna sign it, so you just saw how I did it. All right, so have your two parts to make your one mug topper. You're gonna lift up what will become the insert part and you're gonna take your bowl of slip. Now this is slip made from the same clay I'm using. This is the B-Mix. And I'm just gonna slip and score it. You don't need a ton of slip. You just need to make some good score marks. And then approximately in the center of this, you know, I know I've got a little room on the outside. So I just score that. Okay. And what I will do is it's really great when I'm making a bunch of these because I'll have all of them laid out like this and then I'll have all the bottoms and then I flip them all over at the same time and it's kind of fun. I'm gonna put that this way. So just line it up approximately even. And then this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna roll our hand. See, I'm just rolling. I'm not smashing, not crushing, I'm not poking. 
I'm rolling and you can start one side to the other start from the center out but you just use your fingers and what you're doing is you're forcing any air that could be trapped between these two layers out get that taken care of and now I'm gonna take this little guy this is called a color shaper I often refer to it as a rubber tip tool I don't know if that's actually made of rubber I don't know I just call it that and I'm just gonna clean this edge up did you see there's a there's a little bit of slip in here that's oozed out and remember when we talk about cracking leaving that wet slip there like that is a recipe for cracking also if you over slip this between the two layers if you put a ton of slip on there that could be a problem too so don't put a lot of slip you saw how I how much I put on there that's all you need so once it's done what I will do is I have these little boards these are actually inserts for a um, Studio Pro Bats wheel throwing system but you could use any board you want and what I do is I just stack them up and then I just keep you know, I'll have a bunch here made, and then at the end of making, I stack them all up. So let me show you what you get over here. I've got a stack from the other day that I made. And you can see these are great, but you could also take some plywood and have them cut into six by six little squares, and then you have great boards for your studio. So here's one I made yesterday. Oh, that's the new deer, that's the new holiday rolling pin. Um, so this was made yesterday, and I'm just checking. It doesn't release quickly and easily. I'm not going to mess with it. So how you dry it, turn it upside down like I have and leave it like that until it comes off by itself. Don't try to pull it off. Don't try to pry it off. If you do that, you will get cracking. So we're going to just cover them back up. And actually, since we got another one here, look, see, I'll just stack that one on there and put that on there. And usually I will do three high, sometimes four high, and then start a new stack so that, that they will dry. Once they're completely bone dry, you'll get something like this. So here's our bone dry one. There's my stamp on the back. There's our pattern on the front. Now, I need to do a little edge cleanup. You notice I didn't really clean it up while I was making it. I don't, I don't worry about that until it's dry. And I mean completely dry. Then I'm going to take a sponge, squeeze it out really well, and then I'm very gently just going to go, and in a downward motion, I'm just going to smooth away any bumps or crumbs or anything that have formed on this edge right here because you don't want sharpness there so I just go all the way around with it and you can do this all over your bucket so if any little pieces or crumbs come off they don't fall on your work surface they go back in the water so that's a good safety practice good studio keeping your studio clean practice right there and so you just keep turning and you you clean that until you get back to the beginning and then I turn it upside down and I do it again because I want to get this top edge as well so you just go all the way around pretty simple so and I'll do this and then once we're at this stage it's dry enough it doesn't have to go back on the boards because it's it's bone dry and then I just check this edge here make sure there's no sharp crumbs or anything make sure there's no areas that could cause a sharp spot there so this is ready to go in the bisque firing. And I will fire these just, just like this, just like that, sitting on the shelf. I don't fire them on the mug. I could, I suppose, like these two, since they are a set, could get fired together. And I might do that, but I don't glaze fire them together. So once you um, have it bisque fired, then you end up with this guy right here. So I always like to show this. I like to show the progression. Here we have a greenware, bisqueware, glaze fired. So you can see shrinking happening. And if we put these on top of each other, oh, they're so close. We didn't have a lot of shrinkage at all between these two. But you definitely have shrinking between these two. See it? So it doesn't shrink that much in the drying. But this one right here is bone dry. I bet if we looked at our wet one, and even if you look, look at the four and a half, oh yeah. So a lot of shrinking actually happens in the drying before you even put it in the bisque kiln. And then more shrinking happens in the glaze. So that'll give you a good idea of the amount of shrinkage. So if you're making them and you think they're really big, they're not going to be really big. They're going to be perfect. Um, last thing I want to mention when you go to glaze them, you'll notice that the very bottom is not glazed. 
but the sides are. Up to you. If you want to glaze the bottoms, you'll have to put them up on little um, sitters, like little, little stilt things, right? But I just don't glaze it. This clay vitrifies at cone five. That's what I fire to, so I don't need to go any hotter. I don't have to worry about it. This is food safe. This is good, even though it's not glazed. Put those back on their mugs. So there you have it, mug toppers. Pretty awesome. All right, so here we have a finished mug topper, and I showed you all the stages of mug toppers, and then we made the one to match this mug right here, which these will both dry, and then they'll go in my next bis firing, and then they'll come out in the next glaze firing, and they'll be done. Now, what else can you use these mug toppers for other than mugs? Well, it's basically a lid. So if you want to make little jars, this could be a lid. You might want to add a little knob to it, I didn't really talk about knobs because you don't need a knob. If you look at how these fit on mugs, you'll notice we have that little bit of overhang. That's okay. You just pick it up like this. This is never going to be too hot to grab. It's not going to be as hot as your mug. So you'll be able to go ahead and move it and everything. So it won't be a problem. Now if you want to put a knob on it, you can. It's up to you. If you're making a little lidded jar, maybe you want a knob, but maybe you make it overhang and you don't need the knob at all, right? So that would be a great use. The other thing that I think these are really good for is if you ever buy jar candles, like those glass jar candles from certain candle companies, which I won't mention, you could make your own toppers. Now I know it comes with the top that sticks down in, but maybe you want to make a cute handmade topper to go in your home or to make available for sale at craft fairs. Like I was saying, if you do shows and craft fairs, these are fabulous things to have. They also make great gifts if you need stocking stuffers, if you need something to do for people at work and you want to give them a gift. Teacher gifts, oh my goodness. So maybe you don't want to make uh, your child's teacher a mug. Maybe you don't want to do that. I did. You don't have to. It's a lot to do when you have like 20 teachers you got to make something for, so mugs might be out of reach. But a mug topper, that's well within reach. My suggestion is if you're going to make mug toppers for just the general public and not for specific mugs, do the four and a half inch cookie cutter on the outside and the three inch on the inside. That gives you enough room so that they'll fit most any type of mug. Now, if you're going to make little teeny tiny espresso mugs, make little teeny tiny espresso mug toppers, right? Simple, easy, and super fun. All right, so there we have it. My voice is not really much better, but it'll get there eventually. Thank you so much for spending your time with me here, um, and I will see you next time in the studio.